Praise the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Good morning and praise the Lord. God is so good to us all the time and all the time we know God is good. I'm excited to be able to share with you this morning some things God put on my heart. And um, I was really, really blessed by your feedback last week and just all of the people sharing the video. Uh, we are now on a few different platforms. So I actually shared on my personal page. You can go to Spirit and Truth Christian Church on Facebook, Christian Church Ministries, and find us there as well as on um, Kankakee Church YouTube. And those are the platforms that we're streaming on live right now. So we, we just thank you for tuning in. And we're just going to jump right into the word. Uh, my prayer this morning is that as we just look at these scriptures, that the Lord God Almighty will impart to us wisdom and strength and courage and heal us and deliver us from the influence of evil that has impeded all of our hearts in some kind of way and kept us from a better reality, a better revelation of who God is to us, in us, and through us. Amen. So thank you for praying with me. So if you got your Bibles, uh, you can open up to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And this this scripture and this passage of scripture that we're going to look at today is is very timely in our world right now um, we are preparing for god knows what and it's for some of us it's scary for some of us it's exciting um, for some of us it is uh, there's a lot of anxiety and tension um, some of us are just checked out, just like I don't even want to hear anymore about the craziness that's going on in the world. Can we just go on home? Nevertheless, those of us who are looking at the scriptures and comparing our lives to them and examining ourselves by what these scriptures say and and dialing in to what the Lord is saying in these times for us. It's very important for us to look at this passage and understand what God is saying. Romans chapter 8, if you have your Bible open. It's just one scripture that I want to highlight to start with, and that is Romans chapter 8, verse 32. It says, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? I'm going to read that again. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And I really want to examine this phrase, all things. Because this phrase, all things, has gotten a lot of people in trouble. Uh, we have heard this uh, scripture that all things work together for the good, for them, you know, for the glory of God. We've heard that, and we're going to look at that a little bit today. And we've heard all things that are given to us freely in other passages of scripture. But how do we, how do we determine what that all things means so that we can with confidence, hold on to the all things that the scripture is talking about. Because if all things is ambiguous in my head and is left to the interpretation of my own heart, not under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures, then I'm subject to be led astray by some wolf telling me that God wants to give you the desires of your heart in all things. And so if, 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 I, if I make the mistake of not seeking out the wisdom of God in what these things are that he means, I'm vulnerable to a very pervasive and malicious attack of the enemy, destroy my faith and rip Jesus right out of my heart. And we see that 
in so many different ways where things like this are just misinterpreted and God is mischaracterized by a phrase that people just don't understand. So one of the things that we'll look at is, is what this all things is not. So he's saying that, listen, God, because this is, this is written to the Romans. We know that things that happened to Christians in Rome, we know what happened to Paul in Rome, the hostility against God's people that were following Christ was so high. It was actually dangerous to be named by that name. And if we in America don't see the hostility towards Christianity, I just don't know what you're looking at because it is strong and it is pervasive and it is deep and it is getting more and more antagonistic. The only thing they haven't started to do with very, um, in very clear terms is gathering us up together to harm us. But he's saying to these people who would be in this very place where early in this book, it said, we have heard of your love. Your love has been noised abroad out through all the land. Everybody has heard about the Christians in Rome. And all of them were under this persecution. And living in these very uncertain times, the governmental tyranny was very high and the people were put to sleep by the circus. And he's, he's assuring them that, listen, I know what you're going through. I know what you're facing. You all are going through some very hard times and you are not alone. But what you need to understand is, is that if God, if what we say we believe, if, if the thing that we say we believe about how we can say, looking up to heaven, that we are the children of the living God. If this is really true, then we all understand and believe that God gave his only son to save us. And he's saying, listen. Earlier in this book, he said that God has showed his love toward us. Romans chapter six, he said God has commended his love toward us in that while we were ungodly, while we were sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. He teaches us in the same book that all we had like sheep have gone astray. Every single one of us has fallen and come short of the glory of God. We have all been enemies of God in our mind and in our hearts and our wicked ways testify against us. But God, through his grace and his mercy. Made a sacrifice to save us and provide reconciliation to himself through the shed blood of his son. And here in Romans chapter eight, verse 32, he's bringing them back to this very reality that, listen, if God didn't spare his son, meaning if God went to the length that he went to, to give all that he gave, to ignore every other reality of the law and actually make Christ the one who would be the propitiation for our sins, if he spared not his own son, why would he not then give us freely all things through him? Why would he not give us all things through him? And so that's very encouraging to think about. Is it you, you step back and you say, wow. Why would I be feeling out of sorts and why would I be feeling like God all of a sudden is getting ready to abandon what he started, that he's going to forsake the work of his own hands? Why would I all of a sudden feel like that because I'm in some kind of way, I'm in some trouble or I'm in some persecution or maybe I'm suffering the need of some things or maybe I'm just confused or hurt or maybe some relationships have gotten broken up. I'm sure all of these things would be true in this congregation of believers in Rome at that time. Jesus even told him, he said, he said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. This is going to cause some problems for y'all. And if you step back and you think about it and you say, is he challenging them to step back and say, man, think about it. If God went to the great lengths that he went to, to save you and to call you his own, For you to be able to say that you are no longer 
cursed, but you are now blessed, that you are no longer weak, but you are now strong, that you are no longer poor, but you are now rich in Christ Jesus. If he went through all of that to completely transform you, to make you a completely new creature in his sight. How is it that now you are in the times that you're in, the struggle that you're in, the pain that you're in, the fear that you're in, all the things you may be feeling that may be negative? How, how would you now conclude that God has forsaken the work of his own hands? He said, man, no, you need to ask yourself this question. If God didn't spare his own son to save you and I, who committed the murders and the thefts and the lying and the backstabbing and the gossiping and the drugging and the partying and the sexing and all of the stuff we did, all this crazy stuff we've done that he would now say, as far as the East is from the West, so far have I removed your sin away from me. He said, I've thrown it into the sea of forgetfulness and I will never bring it up again. He said, man, if he went through that, that length to save you, through Jesus Christ dying, through him giving his son to death and the grave. Why would he not now finish what he started and give you all things? And so we have to look at this all things because the all things is what has us confused. It's, I don't have enough of this and I don't have enough of that. And me and her are not getting along and my job is not the greatest and my car keeps breaking down and my kids are not acting right. And my husband is not acting right. Or my wife is not acting right. Or my parents are a mess or my parents got a divorce or I lost a loved one or a friend or whatever it may be. The world is going crazy. What is this all things that he's going to give me through Jesus Christ? But well, we know that it's not something that Jesus spoke very plainly about. And you can see that in Matthew chapter six, starting at verse 25. Jesus said, therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. <laughs> and I'm laughing. So I don't, I, I'm laughing, thinking about the days that I went through. Like, what? Don't think about my life. That's exactly what he said. He said, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink or what you shall, how you shall, um, even yet your body, what you shall put on is not the life, the life more than meat and the body more than your clothing. And he goes on to talk about this reality that we look, we need to look at in Matthew 6, 26. He says, behold, look at the fowls of the air. They don't sow. They don't go out and gather anything up. They don't have barns to store anything. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much better than them? Verse 27, he says, which of you by taking thought could add one cubit Unto his stature. How many of you can make yourself grow? And he says, and why take thought for what you have to wear? He says, look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. They, they don't work at all. And they don't spin anything for themselves to be look beautiful. Verse 29, it says, and yet I say unto you that even Solomon, who was the richest, wisest king in the world, and all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verse 30, he says, wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? See, it was the same thing going on when Jesus was walking the earth. It was so many people turning away and so many people afraid and so many people hurt and there was so much chaos that actually came with the presence of this man jesus christ see we think that the, the prophets because this book that we read their words from is so popular and so notable and has so much notoriety that when they lived that they were actually really really popular when actually the prophets got killed up to 
and including Jesus. And the people that followed them, they stood to stand the same fate for following them. And here's Jesus saying the same thing. This, this thing that you're worrying about in your life, you need to stop worrying about it. He points them back to God in, in the most simple reality and says, look, if God will take care of flowers that are going to die tomorrow. Why would he not take care of you who he has made provision for to live forever? So then how do we reconcile this in our heads and where is it in scripture that we can look at? to see with some kind of clarity that we understand what he's talking about. Well, if you turn to the book of second Peter, this gives us a little more understanding and insight as to, Oh, that's what he's talking about when he says all things in second Peter, it says that I'm just going to start from verse one. It says Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse two, grace and peace be unto you multiplied through the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord, according as his divine power. Verse three, this is key. According as his divine power has given unto us all things. But he doesn't stop there. He says that pertain unto life and godliness. You see, so even if you go back to um, trust in the Lord and he shall bring it to pass. And, you know, we hear that that verse. Uh, let me let me just read that real quick to make sure I'm not misquoting it. That's Psalm 37. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. A lot of us are doing that right now. Not to be envious against the workers of iniquity. A lot of people are mad at him. Verse two, he said, for they should soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Verse three, trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land and barely thou shalt be fed. Same thing. You're going to be okay <laughs> if you trust the Lord. Verse for he says, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. So what does that have to do with all things? It's the same thing that he's saying. Listen, this all things is directly connected to where you are in this world. See, because all things to a saint is not all things to a, a sinner. See, what, what somebody who has not been regenerated in their mind, someone who has not renewed their mind and been transformed through a better understanding of who God is, what God says, what God wants, what his will is, all things could be a lot of bad things. But what God is saying is that all these things has to do with how you delight yourself in the Lord. How you let go of the things in this world and lay hold of to the unchanging hand of God. All things have to do with life and godliness, not what you think and, and what you're dreaming. See, this all things has less to do with what's going on in this world and more to do with what's going on in the people that God has in this world. See, he said you are a light, right? What does that mean? He's saying that you're going to be in dark places where you need to shine. He said, behold, I'm sending you forth as sheep among wolves. What does he tell us? I'm going to send you in a dangerous direction. <laughs> and I, I, I'm, I'm only laughing because I just remember how confused I was when I was like, whoa, so this is not all going to be easy. This is not all going to be about me. This is not about me, my four and no more. This is about the will and the kingdom of God. 
This is about his life. He said he said life and godliness, right? Life and godliness. That means life in him is the life. He said, I am the life. He said, I'm the truth, the way, and I am the life. And everything we need and desire, we can look in Old and New Testament, is directly connected to where our hearts are concerning the Lord. See, many of us, our perception of who God is in us, to us, and through us has been hijacked by a very corporate sanctioned understanding of what church is all about. And what do you mean corporate sanction? I mean that it's all about becoming a star. It's all about becoming the best. It's our church and not the church. It's my pastor and not the pastors. It's one location and not many locations. It's tied to one little point on the map instead of global. It's kingdom with a little K instead of kingdom with a big K. It's so territorial that it's sickening to look at how people view what they should be desiring in the kingdom of God. We married and we want our spouses to make us happy. We have children and we want our children to make us happy. Children grow up and they want their parents to make them happy. They want their boyfriend or their girlfriend to make them happy. We want to find jobs that make us happy. We, we want all of these external things to come into our lives, our lives to make us happy when really those are not the things God gives us to make us happy. God gave us his son to make us happy. See, he gave us his son so that we could have something inside of us. Remember what he told the woman who had all of the husbands and a bad reputation who ended up Jesus telling her, listen, I have some water for you that it will spring up into everlasting life. That woman came with water pots to get tangible water and left the pots because she had eternal water. She didn't go back to tell the people how good of a person she was. She went back to tell the people how good of a person Jesus is. It was a transformation. It was a shift. Her heart had changed from her little world and her sin and trying to make herself look better after all the things she's done. And she received that justification that came from the king of kings. He gave her her identity. And now the shame that she once wore, she allowed that to be hung on Jesus. So that her life and all things related to her life could now be fulfilled by the God of heaven. And so if by now you don't understand, if you don't see that really it's all these things that we focus on, that's really what messes with us and our, in a, our ability to actually lock into the life that can't be taken away from us. See, and it's in that life that, that there's this burst of creativity and this burst of joy and this endless stream of wisdom and knowledge and understanding there's there's this peace that flows like a river that comes from this life that comes from above that has no connection to the world and the fashion thereof it's in this world but it's not of this world it's for this world but it's not from this world and god wants to operate in our hearts first and then through us. See, these times that we're living in right now, people need that light. 
But what people are getting is this strange light. Because people are not thinking about this. All things work together. This all things that God would give us this all things that pertain to life and godliness this all things that has nothing to do with anything other than the kingdom of God. See, that's the all things. See, because if it's not one of those things that pertain to life and godliness, one of the things that pertain to Jesus, one of the things that pertain to his kingdom, his name, his glory, then it's no thing. It's nothing. It's going to fade away. And so many of us have this lack of confidence about what's coming. And that's God knows what. And it would be rightfully so to be afraid about what's coming if you are afraid about where you're at right now. You afraid if the pandemic going to take your job or take your position or take your kids or if the government going to come in and do something that just just really hurts everybody. Or if there's going to be a massive uprising and and Nate from city to city, there'll be riots and, you know, all of this stuff they saying could be coming. Jesus, that's nothing new. Jesus was talking about that back in uh, John chapter 14. You can read it in Matthew. There'll be wars and rumors of wars and nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And it's going to be all he said, but don't let your heart be troubled. He said, you believe in me. Believe in God also. Because the very God that didn't spare his own son to save us, the very God that said at no, don't stop at any expense. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. This saying God is saying, and right where you are right now, if you turn your heart to me, if you trust in me with all your heart, I got all the things you need. I got all things. All things. See, because if it's not in Christ, it has nothing to do with you. <laughs> I said that and I mean it. Why? Paul said, nevertheless, not I. See, Paul understood, wow, this is not about me and my life. It is not me. He said, it is Christ that lives in me. He said, I, I have counted everything I achieved, everything I dreamed of, everything I claim to be in this world, every hope, every notion, every ideal I had, even my religious and political views. I've let all of them go and counted them as rubbish. And I now press toward the mark for the high prize of the calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul forsook all. Peter, they said, Jesus said to them, after all these people walked away, he turned to his disciples and he said, will you walk away also? They said, man, where are we going to go? You have the words of life. You have all things that we need. And see, so what we see is, is, is a depreciation of the gospel. We see a lack of understanding. And sometimes this is what has to happen. We have to come back to the basics. What did God do? And tell me if God did what he did, which was gave his son. This is what Paul is saying. What did he do? If you believe that's what he did, do you believe that all of a sudden now he's going to stop? That now he's not going to give you what you need. He's not going to protect you and keep you and hold you and comfort you and strengthen you. Or are we distracted? You see, because his river never runs dry. 
He said, I'm going to give you peace. He said, not the peace that the world gives you because we all can see that that's just going up and down and in and out and it's on one day, off the next day. It just never stops changing. We're waiting on, you know, what, what is the government going to say about this, the vaccine? What is the government going to say about money? What is the government going to say about stimulus? What is the government going to say about education? What is the, We keep looking to the wrong government. We keep looking to the wrong powers. We keep listening to the wrong voices and we need to go back to the voice of the Holy One. If you heard last week, those words, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, because it is God who gives us all things richly to enjoy. Second Peter, he says that he gives us all things pertaining unto life and godliness. I'm back in Second Peter, his divine power has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. And this is how I'm going to leave you today. When he says this, all things where we read from in Romans chapter eight, most of us know those verses, especially those, you know, he says, hey, if God be for us, who can stand against us? And, you know, and all of that. And that, that verse we read, verse chapter eight, verse 32 in Romans is kind of a culmination. Man, listen, if God did all of this, why would he stop now? If he gave it, if he didn't spare an expense and that expense was up to and including his son, he gave us the world to start with. We messed that up. And then he came to help us to get back to the place where we could get it again through his son and be saved. He says, if he didn't spare that expense, then why would he not through him give us all things? Peter says this. This is where to get practical. How do I now? How, what do I do now? What do I do? And it's going to be kind of strange maybe for some of you he says according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through what through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue and this is where we need to understand and this is this is so i'm so passionate about this thing right here because for me, this is like this is was a mind warp. It makes no logical sense. So I'm just warning you up front. This is not going to be a logical thing. But remember, most of the stuff that God is doing is not <laughs> logical. It doesn't appeal to the intellect of man. He said, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So I want you to think about it from the context of is God does things in a very mysterious way. And a lot of those things that he does, it confounds the enemy that wants to plague us all. You're not his enemy and I am not either. We're his beloved. Through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory and virtue. With that being said, I want to turn to the book of Corinthians. And I'm going to end with this right here. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Through the knowledge of him that called us in glory to glory and virtue, we actually receive everything that pertains to life and godliness. We have been blessed with all spiritual gifts in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. So we already know, I said this is going to be kind of a, a, a mysterious thing, but if you think about it, it's really not so complicated. Through the knowledge of him, we, we receive these things, whereby, and if you read the rest of that, it's like all these other things happen through the knowledge of him that called us. So then our concentration now it's not what I know. It's not what you know. It's what the Lord knows. Think about this. 
it says that it says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, a nation of images, imaginations, a nation of images, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. <laughs> So this is not like a one time thing. If you look for the knowledge of Christ, the knowledge of God, the knowledge of our Lord, you will see some very powerful things attached to having it. In Second Corinthians chapter three, this is practical. So this is what we need to be concentrating on. This is what he says. Verse 17 He says, now the Lord is that spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face beholding. So with no veil, Christ has removed the veil away with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image. From glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Now, how, what does that have to do with the knowledge of the Lord? Well. It has to do with like this. When counterfeit um, agents, um, agents who seek out counterfeiters for U.S. currency. I found it very interesting. They don't study counterfeit currency at all. The only currency they study is the real thing. They get the first hot off the press, press printed U.S. validated currency and they study it from corner to corner all the way from the top to the bottom until they know it inside and out. So if you ever put a counterfeit dollar in their hand, they know right off the bat where it came from. It's fake. This tells us that as we behold Jesus Christ, not Christ-like, not your pastor, not your teacher, not your mama, not your daddy, not your church. It says we are with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're changed into the same image. So what do I need to do? First, if I believe that Jesus Christ died for me and I've accepted this penalty paid on my behalf because I was wrong, I can actually voice that I have been wrong. I've been defiant. I've been rebellious. I've been a liar. And I can say that to the point where I can see and all the better what I've done was against God. It wasn't because of my mama. It wasn't because of my daddy. It wasn't because of the government. It wasn't because of a bad cop. I did what I did because I was a sinner lost and I did that knowing it was wrong and I did it against God period and I can say and I now have received this grace that God has provided me through Jesus Christ now once you do that it is not the time to go run off looking into all of this other weird stuff he said no you need to study that glory that just came into your life you need to study Jesus not necessarily what Jesus did. And I'm not saying it doesn't include what Jesus did, but you need to study his character. Study his heart. You need to behold that glory. Study his relationship with his heavenly father, with your heavenly father. It says you study that. And anything counterfeit coming to that. You immediately reject it. You cast it down because it's coming against the knowledge of God. It's coming to make you a captive. It's coming to take you hostage. It's coming to take you back to the weak and beggarly things that you came from in the first place. It's coming to steal your destiny. It's coming to steal your joy, destroy your peace, wreck your house, make you just some kind of vile creature. Bring up all of the old stuff to bring up the bitterness that was in your heart that God delivered you from and defile you again.
And he says that this is not a process that stops. He says that if we look at Jesus and behold the glory, this, it happens, it says, from glory to glory. It just keeps going on and on. That's why he says, I, I, I beseech you, brother, and therefore by these mercies of God. You've heard me talk about this mercy. In Romans chapter 12, right after what we're reading, he ends up saying, I beseech you, therefore, this God who spared not his own son, but saved you. This God that says, if you be if he's for you, nobody can stand against you. This God who gave his son while we were sinners, not when we got right, when we were sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. This God, he says, I'm begging you by these mercies that God has shown us to present your body. That's practical. See, you can practically sit down and study the scriptures to look at Jesus. He said, I'm begging you by the mercies of God, present your body a living sacrifice. Jesus was a dead sacrifice. The lambs and the goats and all of the all of that stuff, the bullocks, those were dead sacrifices. He says, now I'm asking you, I'm begging you to present your body a living sacrifice. Holy, holy how? Made holy by the blood of Jesus Christ. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Brothers and sisters, if we understand that it's only reasonable for us to give our life to the Lord based on this mercy that he's given us, all things become clear. Paul said it. He said, all things are yours. You have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The desires of your heart, you will start to see. It happens. I, I watch that in my own life, man. Sometimes Pam will be talking my wife, who loves the Lord dearly. Sometimes she'll just be talking about something. And you probably have experienced it too, talking about something. That afternoon is there. Didn't even pray. God just gave it to her. But the real issue with that is is that what she's talking about has to do with the life that she lives in Christ Jesus and being that vessel of honor unto him as you leave this stream today I pray that you take an inventory and examine yourself to see if you are in the faith this is what the scripture challenges us to do examine yourself have you allowed all these other things to come in and distort your perception of the all things that God would give us through Jesus Christ? Have you lost your childlike faith to believe in God for all things? My God can do anything. Are you frustrated because your anything has now uh, an aversion to worldliness and lust like we talked about last week and sensual and devilish stuff? I'm going to challenge you to do your own assessment. Sit down and reconcile in your heart where you are with the Lord. Is it about him and his kingdom or is it about you and yours? Is it about serving God and his purposes or is it about realizing your own, finding yourself? And I want to tell you, I sympathize with any of you that may have grown weary, I've done it. I've grown weary and, and I've taken a step back and or to the side and I've gotten angry and hurt as a result of that. But I want to tell you, God is merciful and gracious. And even if you've grown weary in your assessment and you realize, man, the word is right. The scriptures are right. I, I've been thinking about the wrong thing. I've let this nation of images come into my mind and bring me 
into captivity to things that I don't even want to be captivity to, be in captivity to. Right there, you'll find that God is so gracious. And you'll understand this scripture that, hey, if God gave his own son, if he didn't spare his own son to save you, he's not going to stop right now by giving you all things that you need right now. And if right now you need that encouraging word, right now you need that strength, right now you need that healing, right now you need to sense that grace and that peace, right now you need to be filled with his joy, right now you need that. All you got to do is say, Lord, you know what? I see it. I got it. I'm done. I am not going to compare my life to this world anymore. I'm going to stop seeking worldly things. I'm going to stop living for my own purposes. I'm going to live for you and you only. And I'm going to trust you to do exactly what this scripture say, which is through Jesus Christ to give me all things. I hope that encourages you. My prayer for you, and I hope you will pray for me, is that as God does this work in our hearts today, as we sit down and assess where we are with this, that we can sense an overwhelming presence of the Lord refreshing us and building us up so that we can keep going and experience all things in him. God bless you. Till next week, may he bless you and keep you.